Welcome to this session. Uh, there are three other lecturers here. And uh, in front of you, now there are two chairpersons. My name is Iko Tohata. And next to me is Professor Ivan Banicek okay. from Czech Republic. And uh, each uh, other lecture will be first uh, taken care of by concerned technical committee chairpersons. So first uh, lecture is uh, uh, Another lecture on the name of the Ishihara lectures. And uh, on the, the end of this table, uh, we have uh, TC203. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, chair, chairperson is a Professor uh, uh, Boulanger, and uh, he is going to introduce what is the Ishihara lecture. Thank you. In uh, 2004, the uh, Technical Committee on, on Earthquakes was pleased to initiate the Ishihara Honor Lecture uh, to honor uh, one of our, 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 our most treasured members in the earthquake engineering community. Uh, Professor Ishihara's seminal contributions uh, and publications, his uh, books, uh, dealing with uh, liquefaction and other topics uh, are underpinned to this day much of our understanding and our approaches for dealing with liquefaction. It's just had a huge impact on our field. In, in, in addition to that, you all know him as one of our past chairs of the International Society. He's also the founding chair for our technical committee itself, and he's always been uh, one of the driving forces for bringing together our international community and working together on, on uh, work earthquake problems and making things uh, better and safer for our societies. So in addition to uh, his seminal contribution, his leadership in the international community, he is also one of the finest, uh, kindest gentlemen uh, in any field, and you know, that is why he's one of our most treasured people in the earthquake engineering community, and it was a uh, very great pleasure for the committee to start this uh, award. With that, I'd point out that our first recipients were uh, Liam Finn, in 2004, followed by uh, Ed Idris in 2007. And so that was our kind of our three amigos. Uh, and then after that, uh, uh, Professors Dobry, uh, George Gazidis, uh, 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 Kokushu, and uh, that rounds off our first five, and today is our sixth one, which I believe Professor Tao will introduce. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, today, uh, the speaker is uh, Professor Jonathan Bray. University of California, Berkeley. The time is running quickly, so I'd like him to come to the dice. And uh, let's take a look. Uh, this is his prominent history, careers. Uh, as far as I know, he has been also very active in after Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand. So his topic today is entitled, entitled Simplified Procedure for Estimating Big Faction Induced Building. Please start with the break. Thank you very much. It really is an honor to be asked to present the sixth Ishihara lecture, and I will present a simplified procedure for estimating liquefaction induced building settlement. This work is largely the PhD work of Jorge Macedo of the University of California, Berkeley, but it builds on work of a number of PhD students as well as other professors. In fact, I want to acknowledge Professor Mishko Chubanovsky of the University of Canterbury, who's really been a partner in terms of investigating the effects of liquefaction in New Zealand. And this work is sponsored by the National Science Foundation as well as others. I really is a, have a heartfelt uh, thanks to the committee, TC203 committee, Earthquake Geotechnical Engineering Associated Problems. It's an incredible group of individuals, uh, tremendous talent, energy, discipline, and creativity, and I, I was actually very surprised that they selected me given all of the outstanding people in this field. And so I'm very humbled to be able to give this talk. And it would not have been possible without the work I've done in the past, and that work has largely been done by these phenomenal PhD students. If you have talented, creative, hardworking PhD students, you can't do bad work. It's just a matter of maybe doing a little bit better work than you would have done otherwise. But uh, this work is largely that of Jorge Macedo, but it builds on work that Roberto Luque did, Shade Dashti, testing by Christopher uh, Markham, and Rodolfo Sancio with the work that we did in Turkey. So it's just incredible to be able to be blessed with these wonderful people. 
And one of the most wonderful people I've ever met is Professor Kenji Ishihara. As I started my career in the 90s, I knew him as this, an official photograph, a, a distinguished gentleman, a leader in the field, uh, and somebody I read his book, I read his papers, and through the years I've gotten to know him, and as I've gotten to know him, it's been really a treasure. In fact, one of the best times I've had in my life was to work on the tailings dam in New Caledonia, where uh, I think Professor Ishihara said it was the worst site visit in terms of weather he'd ever had. I was dancing in the rain. I just, the opportunity of working with Kenji Ishihara and interacting with him was just incredible. Even with the rain and all of the difficult conditions, his eye for detail, checking every little aspect out, and then going back into the office and training and educating the consulting engineers on some key concepts in liquefaction, I learned as well. And then the way he took the data from the testing and plotted it in a new way to, to illustrate key concepts, I'm glad that I've had a chance to work with him. I'm going to talk about liquefaction, and I think most people in the room are familiar with the key aspects of liquefaction. It really is earthquake shaking causing poor water pressure in a contractive soils. And all soils, even dense soils, initially when they first are loaded are a little bit contractive. And so that contractive tendency for saturated soils is expressed by the water pressures increasing. And obviously, effective stress decreases as the pore water pressure increases, and that leads to a reduction in stiffness and strength. And there's a lot of nuances. There's the phase transformation line. There's a lot of details in terms of the liquefaction phenomenon. But I'm going to focus on the effects of liquefaction. And as a practicing engineer, the thing I care most about is displacement, and hence I care about strain. I care about deformation. And this plot shows, for example, there's things going on in the background, but you see that as you cycle this, this is the number of cycles increasing as it walks up, you eventually get to a point where the pore water pressure rapidly increases and you get this dramatic loss in stiffness and strength which leads to large deformations. And so obviously as engineers, we're, we're very careful, we should be very careful when it comes to these types of things. And the consequences of liquefaction can be severe. For example, this is a flow failure for a tailings dam during the Malay earthquake in 2010, which unfortunately claimed the lives of four people. Professor Ishihar's work has reached a lot of different areas, but one of his uh, lasting contributions was actually in the International Conference back in 1985, where he used uh, case history data, in this case, to look at the effects of liquefaction. He had done a lot of work on the phenomenon of liquefaction and the details, but this was a chance to look at the effects of liquefaction. And one of the most obvious effects is liquefaction-induced ground damage, such as these sand boils that you see here. And he took case history data, and if we're looking at just a peak ground acceleration of 0.2 g, he looked at the relationship between when you had damage and when you didn't have damage. And a big issue there was not just the thickness of the liquefiable sand, but the uh, thickness of the non-liquefiable layer. And in fact, that's still used today in terms of looking at the effects of ejecta and, and manifestations of liquefaction at the ground surface. Another very important plot is this post-liquefaction volumetric strain and shear strain plot, where he took laboratory testing from his PhD student and plotted it up in a very interesting way. He looked at the factor of safety against liquefaction, so as the factor of safety is decreasing, you're getting more volumetric strain, for example. And he brought in the important aspect of relative density, 90, 60, and 40% relative density. And you can see the dramatic change in the response of the material once you cross a factor of safety of 1.0. And so with these kind of plots, you can estimate the factor of safety, the relative density, estimate the volumetric strain, but also estimate the shear strain. And we're going to use that plot later today. I will focus on the effects of liquefaction on buildings. And this largely started as a result of the Kojali earthquake in 1999 in Adapazari, Turkey, where there were significant buildings, uh, six-story buildings, that were built on just about a couple of meters of liquefiable material, and they collapsed due to a bearing capacity failure. These two buildings here, basically splitting apart and, and rotating, tilting out. Uh, significant ejecta, not in the open field, but next to buildings that led to punching settlement and deformations. 
And we see similar things with different type of construction in Christchurch in the Central Business District where we have buildings that actually are sliding, they're punching down in the liquefied soil. We even have buildings that are on shallow foundations tilting as a result of ground softening from liquefaction. We often talk about what liquefaction can do to our structures. I think it's important to realize that structures play a role in this. This is a case in Chile where there was no liquefaction in the open fields. There was no liquefaction where there were these light one-story buildings. It was this regional hospital that had just been constructed. When they needed it most, right after the earthquake, it was put out of operation because of liquefaction. The additional weight of this building and, this, and the inertia load of that building essentially helped produce the liquefaction that led to the ground deformations that caused the, uh, the damage. And we see that in the centrifuge. This is a centrifuge model where there's a one, uh, single degree of freedom system above it. This is just looking at the foundation. And you can see when the ground shaking occurs, the building basically shakes itself into the soil. Another classic example of the effects of liquefaction is this case history that was identified for, by Professor Tokimatsu after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, where we have a building that's on drilled piers where the neutral plane is well below the liquefiable material and for all intents and purposes did not settle. So that's our frame of reference. That's where the ground was. And we see very clearly this 300 millimeters of free field settlement that's the post-liquefaction, one-dimensional, post-reconsolidation settlement that you get because of that. That's the 300 millimeters. This building here, which is a three-story building on a, on a shallow mat foundation, it punched into the ground 400 millimeters. So the total settlement of that building is the 400 millimeters that it punched into the soil, as well as the 300 millimeters that the soil went down with respect to where it was originally. So the total settlement of this building relative to the building it was next to was 700 millimeters. And very importantly, uh, what the profession had been doing is largely using the post-liquefaction volumetric settlement to estimate settlement of buildings. Clearly, the shear deformation and the punching of the building into the soil is equally important, if not more important. So that leads us to displacement mechanisms that were largely found through centrifuge testing and then confirmed by case histories. And that is first the, the obvious one of ground failure or ground settlement due to the loss of ejecta. If you've got 300 millimeter thickness of soil here that liquefies and it comes up to the ground surface, then you've lost 300 millimeters of support and your building's gonna move down about that much. If you don't have ground loss due to ejecta, or in addition to that, you can have shear-induced deformations. You can think about a building that's base isolated, so it doesn't have inertial loads, but if the soil loses its stiffness and loses its strength, then you're going to have a building that it was supporting now sink in to that softened soil. I call that the bearing capacity component. And then we have what we talked about in terms of that centrifuge test and the case in, Ch in Chile, where we have a building that has inertia, and so it can also walk itself into the liquefied soil. And in fact, this is one of the more damaging ones because you're pulling up on the soil and then you're pushing into it. So it's a very effective way of developing settlement. And then last and not least is the volumetric deformations. And we know about sedimentation if we get liquefaction and the re reforming of the structure. We also get post-liquefaction reconsolidation. But very importantly, we do get some drainage occurring during strong shaking because we have very high hydraulic radians. One of the most important things is to learn from case history. So I, I, I started this research because of case histories and when I went to uh, New Zealand, the focus was on documented or documenting uh, case histories. And so this is a six-story building uh, that settled 60 millimeters relative to this building next to it that did not punch into the surrounding ground. And then we have maybe 10 to uh, 30 millimeters of settlement between adjacent columns. But it's really over the last two bays, the southern two bays, where we get on the order of about uh, 300, uh, 200 millimeters of differential settlement. And that's largely because of ejecta, which you can see here, as well as volumetric and shear-induced deformation. So we have precise measurements in terms of differential settlement, 310 on the southeast 
southeast corner and 60 on the northeast corner. We also have LIDAR measurements that give us a sense of the total settlement, and we can estimate approximately how much settlement we have on the south side because of the ejecta. We have no settlement on the north side. There was no ejecta there. And we can estimate the volumetric, and the difference has got to be the shear-induced deformation. So it's about 100 to 200 millimeters on the south side, and that's 60 millimeters that we measured on the north side. Once we have that data, and that's why we run out to those sites and capture that perishable data, now we can come back a few months later and we can advance cones, and this is that same site, this is the building footprint, and we're pushing a CPT in. This is a tip resistance, and this is I sub C, the soil behavior type index, for four cones put in this area. And then we've used Robertson and Ride to actually calculate the factor of safety against liquefaction, and the area that is uh, yellow is areas that have factors of safety less than or equal to one. And then we have a siltier sand that's shallow. It's basically a buried stream channel that just cuts across the south end of the building that also liquefies. So obviously the liquefaction at depth is important. It can lead to overall settlement of the building, but the ground goes down with it as well. What's most damaging is the liquefaction right beneath the seat of that uh, settlement or right beneath the building foundation because we get ejecta as well as shear deformation. With the case history and with the centrifuge testing looking at mechanisms and with the field data with the CPT followed up by borings and, and laboratory testing, then we're at the point where we can say now we have enough information to do a fully nonlinear dynamic soil structure interaction effective stress analysis. Critical that it's a nonlinear model. Obviously, it's dynamic. We have to pull in the soil structure interaction aspect of this, and we need to have an effective stress model. These analyses were done with FLAC. FLAC is a very powerful computer program that's used widely in the U.S. as well as other places around the world. And we're using the PM4 SAN version 3 model, which is a wonderful model because it has great mechanistic underpinning, and it's been developed by a brilliant engineer who actually brings in his engineering sense to it to make sure it gets results that match. And so I have found that that's a very powerful model. It can capture the kinds of things we're seeing in the lab in terms of the development of, of transient softening and stiffening and then dilation, and then we basically get softening. You can see the resulting pore pressure increase. So with that type of model, we can then represent that looser sand that's underneath the south part of the building. We can capture the rest of the material with, other, with that same model with different parameters, and then we can do our analysis. And what we find here is that a significant amount of the shear strain is occurring in this shallow, loose, silty layer. You can see the deformation in the shallow soil is much greater than it is in the free field because of the building basically exerting the shear stress and that additional deformation. Because of that, we get much more settlement on the south corner than we get on the north corner. And in fact, we get a prediction, which is shown in red, and of course we don't know what the properties are, so we vary them, and we get a range of calculated settlement that matches the best estimate of the shear-induced deformation. We shouldn't match what was actually measured in the field because this continuum-based model cannot capture ejecta. So it's very important to realize what your model can do and then what it can't do. And so we're, we can capture volumetric, we can calculate shear, but we have to then add in the ejecta to actually get the measured response. So this is a case where it was really bearing capacity and ejecta that were governing principles. Another building where we went through the same type of thing in terms of capturing the data after the earthquake, doing field testing, laboratory testing, and then advanced analysis, I want to show you this because it's a different mechanism. This is a building that is a seven-story building that's shaking back and forth, and you can see it more clearly here. The east is in the purple color, and the west side is in the yellow color, and you can see the cycling loading. And so, for example, when the east is going up, the west is going down, and then vice versa. You can kind of see it walk itself into the soil. And that the edges of the foundation settle more than the interior column because of that SSI ratcheting. So with that calibration and saying we have a model that can capture what we saw in the field, if properly calibrated, then we can go forward and say, let's do a series of fully nonlinear 
SSI effective stress analysis. Let's start with a baseline model where we have a building that's 12 meters wide, uh, 12 meters high, has a bearing pressure of 80 kPa. Let's put it at a depth of one meter into the soil. Let's have a crust that's two meters thick on top of a liquefiable layer that's three meters thick that has a relative density of 50 percent. And then we have non-liquefiable soil and then a compliant base. Because we want to understand how this phenomenon occurs, we're going to now do a sensitivity study where we're going to vary the thickness of the liquefiable layer, the thickness of the non-liquefiable layer. We're going to estimate or vary the relative density of the liquefiable layer. We're going to look at different building widths, heights, and different contact pressures. So we have a generalized case where we're looking at maybe uh, is 105 models, uh, and we are set, we are looking at how the uh, more or less a regular building that's two to eight stories tall would respond on a site that can be captured by these average properties. Of course, the ground motion is important, so we're going to run 36 different ground motions through that are selected to push the structure in different directions. So in the end, we do 1,300 analysis that we can interrogate. Most importantly is to look at the mechanisms. And you see that this is the liquefiable layers, three meters thick. This is the foundation. You're seeing, as you would expect, most of the shear deformation developing within the liquefiable layer. Also very importantly, um, the dotted lines show the uh, sh volumetric in blue and the shear in red at 15 seconds in when the strong shaking is at its maximum. And the solid lines show the volumetric in blue and the red uh, is shear at, at the end of strong shaking. And what you're seeing is that most of the deformation is a result of shearing, especially when you're in the area of strong shaking. It's largely shear-induced deformation, not volumetric. And even at the end of strong shaking, the volumetric is starting to pick up, but it's mainly shear. Now, what leads to settlement is vertical strain. And so we look at the vertical strain profile. And in some cases, it looks a little bit like what we might think in terms of the Schwertman Triangle where you might say, okay, one of the analogies of here is we have a method for estimating static settlement on sands. Can we borrow from that and bring that forward to look at earthquakes? In some cases, it looked like we might be able to do that, but then when we started looking at different ground motions, I'm just looking at 12 of the 36 to look at some of the details, and you can see that obviously the loading is much more complex. It's dynamic as opposed to being static. And so it's not going to have that nice strain field that we have for the Schwertman me method. We're going to have to do something more complicated to capture these variations in vertical strain, which lead to settlement. And what's really important, then, is the ground motion. The ground motion caused those different vertical strain profiles through the soil. And so let's look carefully at one ground motion. This is the acceleration time history. This is the development of the excess pore pressure under the building, and in the yellow color is in the free field. This is what we normally see, is because the building has a higher total vertical stress, the excess, the excess pore pressures are higher under the building, and so we are tending to have flow of water from underneath to outside. Ricardo Dobie saw that in his centrifuge test uh, uh, about 20 years ago. And we confirmed that when we did our centrifuge test. But it's also very important that you get in a lot of high transient uh, gradients that move water back and forth. Then in terms of settlement, that's what we care most about. That's the black line, is the amount of settlement in millimeters. You can see that most of it's occurring during strong shaking. The sh shaking's about over here. You're still getting some additional settlement. You can say that that looks a lot like post-liquefaction reconsolidation volumetric settlement. But most of the settlement th that's occurring during strong shaking is that shear-induced settlement that's occurring. And so we're trying to find a ground motion parameter that can actually capture that. And so we're looking at two. We're looking at areas intensity, how that builds up over time. That's essentially integrating the acceleration squared over time. And then a newer parameter called the standardized cumulative absolute velocity, which actually matches the settlement very nicely. The nice thing about this is there's actually an updated uh, relationship that estimates this, and it estimates it with a fairly low standard error. We want to look at number of ground motions. So we have a, a generic model that we're using that captures things in general, and we're looking at intensity measures, ground motion intensity parameter 1, ground motion intensity parameter 2. First thing you'd like to do is just use one ground motion parameter. Uh, we found out that we, we need to, to use at least two. And 
looking through this, we, for example, we found PGA. It doesn't correlate well. It doesn't have a high R squared value. But spectral acceleration at one second on, on the free field condition as if it didn't liquefy the surface motion, that correlates fairly well with, uh, with the amount of settlement. Other parameters that we either used or created didn't do quite as well. And the nice thing about that is a lot of building codes use spectral acceleration at one second, so you tend to have that in the free field. And then in terms of other parameters, it really came down to cumulative absolute velocity and areas intensity. And because cumulative absolute velocity can be predicted with greater certainty, we chose it. Plus it matched things and, and captured things a bit better. So in the end, in terms of looking at settlement, versus a ground motion parameter such as the standardized cumulative absolute velocity, you can see that there's a general trend that as you increase that intensity measure, you increase the settlement. Also, as you increase the spectral acceleration at one second of the ground motion, the settlement increases. So that's encouraging. Then we start looking at the effects of the soil properties. And one of the most obvious ones is relative density. And so we see that building settlement is going to decrease as relative density increases. But it's also very important to look at the trends here. Is there's not much difference between 30, 35, 40, 50 percent relative density. The material is so loose that the, the building settles into it, and there's not a huge difference in terms of change in relative density. Then you get to a point where going from 50 percent relative density to 60 to 75 causes a significant change in terms of the rate of settlement as the rate of, uh, as the relative density is increasing. And then you eventually get to a point where uh, whether you go from 80 to 85 to 90 to 95% relative density doesn't make as big a difference. And so we want to be able to capture that shape curve. The liquefiable layer thickness is important, but only to a point. I mean, as, as the liquefaction, the thickness of the liquefiable layer increases, you get additional settlement, but as you might expect, it's nonlinear and eventually you get to a point where it doesn't matter. If there's a sufficient thickness of liquefiable material, then you can accommodate those shear strains, which are largely leading to deformation, and you get your building settlement. So one of the plots I had used in practice that I don't use anymore and I encourage you not to use is this plot where they originally, for deeper soils, they, they averaged the foundation settlement by the thickness of the liquef liquefiable layer, and they averaged the building width by the thickness of the liquefiable layer. That leads you to believe that it's proportional to the thickness of the liquefiable layer. Um, some of the testing that was done early on confer follows that trend, but Shadeh Ashti and I deliberately did centrifuge tests, which are marked in green, with thin layers that showed that that proportionality didn't work, and now we've complemented that with these 1,300 plus analyses that show that sometimes it falls in that range, but for relatively thin layers, you can actually, that normalization doesn't work. In terms of the non-liquefiable layer thickness, uh, obviously that's got to be important because as the non-liquefiable layer thickness gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you're ending up uh, moving the seat of settlement further out of the, uh, or moving the liquefiable material out of the seat of settlement. So the building is at a depth of one meter and you see significant uh, settlement. Obviously once the, the soil is no longer right beneath the foundation, it reduces then things are pretty much steady state, but then as you go thicker and thicker and thicker, you're pushing the, you're, you're getting the seat of settlement not as much into the liquefiable layer, and so this will continue to decrease to where eventually you get down to essentially zero. <coughs> Building contact pressure is important, and a number of other people have seen this, and so we're seeing things that are consistent with the work of Tokimatsu and Ricardo Dobry and others, is that the settlement will increase as the load increases, it will get to a point where it will start to go nonlinear, and there's actually some cases where we're actually calculating settlement that is actually less as the load gets higher. At first I didn't trust that, but then I went back to my centrifuge test. I went back to some centrifuge tests done by some other people as well as some analysis, and if the load is high enough, you may not get the strain reversals that are so damaging. You may not get the pore pressures to get to a point of liquefaction. The pore pressures might be high, but in terms of a ratio compared to their initial vertical stress, they're not that high. And so you end up basically get to a point where things don't change much. Building contact pressure is correlated to the height of the building. As the building gets higher, the contact pressure gets uh, higher. 
We, so we did look at the building height separately. A number of other investigators have identified that as being important. But for buildings that are only two to eight stories tall, we didn't see a need to, uh, to bring in height of the building. Width of the building was important in the sense that, as other people have seen, as the width of the building increases, the settlement reduces. Uh, last but not least, I think, you know, it's just like we use a stability number in excavations, we might use a post liquefaction factor of safety when we get to levy stability. Uh, this, it's a good idea to essentially say, okay, in a pseudo-static sense, if, if I have liquefaction in my lower layer, layer two, might that lead to a buried capacity failure? There is a generalized solution for a, uh, a two-layer system by Meyerhoff and Hanna. They developed it for undrained loading of clays, but if we use the liquefied strength as the strength of the lower layer and do these calculations, we can calculate a factor of safety against bearing capacity. And what's important is it's an index of whether you might have large deformations or not. If you have a high factor of safety greater than 1.5, your deformations will probably be reasonable, under about 100 millimeters or so. When you cross 1.5, you start to get increased amounts of movements. And when you have a factor of safety less than one, you have the potential for large movements. You don't always get large movements because this two-layer uh, system is over an oversimplification. So if you have relatively very thin layers as the liquefiable layer, or you have a high contact pressure, that's the reason why you get some of these cases. And so it's, it's not 100%. But it does show the general trend that if your factor of safety is less than one, you're going to tend to have a problem. So the key insights is the shear induced mechanism is governing building settlement in the cases that you don't have ejecta. And there's important ground motion parameters, there's important site parameters, and there's important building parameters to capture. And we should always step back and look at a factor of safety against bearing capacity in the post-liquefaction state as an index of whether we might have large deformations. So now we want to go one step further and say, can we use these analyses to develop a simple, simplified method? And so we know that relative density is an important parameter, whereas we could specify it in our generalized analysis and we know what it is from our centrifuge tests, we're not going to be able to easily capture that uh, in the field without some type of test. And we also want to capture the thickness of the non-liquefiable layer. We want to be able to do a site investigation. So the tool we want to use is the CPTU. Because in a, in a, in a sandy material or a non-plastic silty material, or even a slightly plastic silty material, the cone penetration test is the preferred way of capturing things like relative density, as well as using that method to capture the factor safety against liquefaction. So with those two parameters, we can then now characterize our soil as having a building foundation of width B that's at a depth of foundation DF. We have a Q applied to it from the building load. We have a thickness of our non-liquefiable crust. And then we have layers, and each layer is defined by the estimate of the relative density from the CPT correlation, and there's several good ones out there, and then the factor of safety against liquefaction. We also have, obviously, the thickness of each layer and the depth of the midpoint of each layer. If we look at Zhang et al. procedure, which Robertson helped develop with his PhD student Zhang, it's based on the work of Ishihara and his student. We know with a factor of safety and a relative density, this relationship helps, helps us estimate the strain potential. So for this layer, it would be 10%. And then we can take each layer that has its strain potential, we can divide it by the depth. So we're very aggressively uh, depth weighting with 1 over Z to be able to really say that liquefaction that's shallow is much more important than liquefaction that's deeper. Of course, we multiply it by the thickness of the liquefiable layer. And this weighting function is just saying we only count those soils that are below the depth of the foundation. And so we now have a new parameter called liquefaction building settlement index, which is a way that we can correlate, and not to relative density, but correlate to LBS. And so the relationship that we developed is the estimate of the shear induced deformation is a function of LBS, the liquefaction building settlement index, as well as the shape that fits the uh, curve that we had in terms of the thickness of the liquefiable layer. 
We have the building load in here, as well as the building width. And then we have our ground motion intensity parameters, standardized cumulative absolute velocity, and spectral acceleration at one second. And we can predict this with an error term. Now, each of these parameters have uncertainty, so you can do a full logic tree and do it that way. But in normal engineering, you're probably going to use best estimates of these values. The standard error term is 0.5, but given that you're using best estimates, maybe a good rule of thumb is to estimate this uh, settlement as your best estimate, saying epsilon is equal to zero, and then half that value and double that value, and you have a reasonable range of settlement that you might anticipate. The model residuals are low. In I mean, actually, the residuals are high, but the bias, there's no bias there. So we've looked at a number of other parameters in addition to these six. So we've calibrated to make sure it fits the data. And then it's, it's good to step back. Uh, Shade Dash, she's been working with her PhD student using a different model. She's been using open C's, a fine element code, as opposed to finite difference. She's used a different constitutive model, one by Professor Elgamal. And if we take her estimates from all of her calculations, and then we take our simplified method, we basically show no bias until we get down to low displacements. And I would argue that shear displacements less than five millimeters are essentially negligible. But in the area where it matters, at 10, uh, uh, 50, 100 millimeters, 200 millimeters, we're tracking very nicely with this totally independent study where they did tens of thousands of analyses. We also can compare it to a centrifuge test. So we have actually 102 model centrifuge test results where we look at what was measured in the centrifuge and what's predicted by this equation, and it captures the shear deformation quite nicely within the factors we'd expect of 1 to 2, 2 to 1. The most important thing, however, is what started the whole thing, and that's the case histories. And to be able to go back and look at, in this case, we looked at 19 field case histories that were very well documented. This is just a subset of those case histories. We have different buildings under the Christchurch earthquake. We have the same building excited by the Christchurch earthquake, the Darfield earthquake, the June event. We have a couple of buildings in Turkey uh, affected by the Kojali earthquake. And what we see is, that the observed settlements, the shear induced settlement, is captured by the 16th percentile to 84th percentile values from this relationship quite nicely. And so that's where we're saying if we do have some issues or some errors, obviously there's some errors in the system, it's calibrated to essentially get answers that are consistent with what we see in the field. So I now offer a method for estimating liquefaction induced building settlement. First, you start off with calculating the factor of safety against liquefaction triggering. Then you calculate the post-liquefaction bearing capacity factor of safety using the post-liquefaction residual strength for the liquefied soil. If that factor of safety is less than one, large movements are possible. If it's greater than one, you want to estimate the settlement. One component could be ejecta. Sometimes you have no ejecta, other times you do. When you have ejecta, then that, that's a very important component to include. So you could use the Ishihara 85 ch chart to help you understand that. Then you estimate the volumetrically induced settlement. Based on that work by Professor Ishihara, we have the Zhang Robertson method of 2002, which estimates, based on the cone, what the volumetrically induced settlement would be. But very importantly, now we have a method to estimate the shear induced deformation. And that's the equation that I offer you in the paper. And the idea is add those together, and you have your total estimate of building settlement. And very importantly, you can look at different characteristics on each side of the building and calculate a differential settlement. Very importantly is this was done for a limited number of cases, regular building loads, a number of other things. Obviously, geology is critical to understand at your site, understanding what are the mechanisms that are controlling your building, and then looking at relevant case histories. So in conclusion, liquefaction-induced building settlement is caused by ejecta, shear, and volumetric mechanisms. The 1D post-liquefaction reconsolidation settlement only captures volumetric. You can capture shear-induced deformation if you do a fully nonlinear effector stress analysis. There are projects where you should do that, but if you have a project where that's outside of your budget or before you do that analysis, you want to sense what the answer is, we have a simplified method that's been, that's 
based on or getting consistent results with a fully nonlinear analysis. In fact, in the end, the procedure gives you results that are consistent with the 19 field case histories that are described in the paper, the 102 centrifuge model tests that we talk about in the paper, as well as thousands of dynamic SSI analysis, not just by me, but by a different person using a different model. Thank you very much.